one of, uh, one of the best essays that um, uh, Hayek ever wrote was the introductory essay to a little book that's been in print ever since it was published, as far as I know, a uh, little collection called Capitalism and the Historians. Um, and it's in paperback. You can get it from the University of Chicago Press. And there's some very good essays in there. Now, that's 50 years old, so it's not the latest uh, research on the Industrial Revolution, but there's a lot of um, uh, good analytical material there, that is, points that uh, have ar arisen again and again <laughs> in, in the debate since then. Now, Hayek's introduction uh, is on uh, politics and history, and he makes some very interesting points. It might seem unfair to you that most people come to whatever conclusion they do on the, uh, about uh, politics and the policy, uh, not on the basis of economic theory, not uh, on the basis of uh, philosophy or natural rights uh, uh, theory, uh, more or less, uh, but on the basis of what they think history has shown, the, the lessons of history. Uh, we see that um, uh, people use that phrase uh, again and again. And um, uh, so it seems fairly evident uh, from uh, uh, personal experience and just looking around uh, what columnists say and so on, that uh, history has an enormous impact on people's political views. History or what they think is history. And we can see this in a number of, <coughs> in a, a number of respects. Um, uh, uh, tell me if you think that this uh, sounds uh, familiar. At the end of the 19th, around 1900, just before and after, uh, America was a laissez-faire society, and in this laissez-faire society, uh, uh, enormous combines and cartels and monopolies arose uh, until uh, the progressive movement came along and thankfully saved us from these monopolists. And good old Teddy Roosevelt, <coughs> who was... Uh, on Mount Rushmore and the favorite uh, um, president of uh, John McCain and uh, other progressives, um, Teddy Roosevelt saved us from these monopolies and cartels. But what that period showed is that you cannot have untrammeled, uh, unregulated laissez-faire. Has anybody ever heard this argument? Right? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, how about another argument? Um, in the 1920s, there was <laughs> unregulated, untrammeled laissez-faire, and uh, greed went uh, uh, rampant, and the result was the stock market crash and the Great Depression. But this is, what, uh, this is Franklin Roosevelt's interpretation of the Great Depression in his first inaugural address, uh, that it was, uh, uh, greed was rampant, private uh, ambition was rampant, and so on, and brought about this Great Depression. Uh, that's probably something you've heard also. Um, this idea that history has taught us some obvious lessons that have to be uh, our guidelines for the future comes up in non-economic areas. Maybe you've heard this argument. <laughs> um, after the First World War, the great idealistic American president whose dream and vision was uh, a world organization that would keep peace forever uh, had his heart broken by the isolationists who refused. <laughs> okay, let, you know, let's not overdo it. <laughs> uh, who, uh, uh, who, who voted not to have the United States enter the League of Nations. And what that led to was the breakdown eventually of world order, the rise of Hitler, and the Second World War. Uh, if... Uh, uh, we had entered uh, the League of Nations, the whole history of the 20th century would have been different and we would have been spared to, uh, many terrible events so that the isolationists who prevented us from entering this wonderful world uh, organization are in a way responsible for what happened afterwards. That's maybe an, uh, an argument or uh, an interpretation people have heard who have taken 20th century American history. Is that possible? You know, there's another interpretation of of what was going on, which is that the uh, Austria-Hungary had been broken up, Russia was uh, knocked out by uh, communism in the Civil War, Germany was now kept down. So what the, the point of the League of Nations was to establish and freeze once and for all Anglo-French hegemony throughout the world. 
uh, since uh, the uh, League of Nations said that aggression was crossing uh, boundaries, trying to change boundaries. So the boundaries of 1919 with the British Empire, the French Empire, were supposed to be frozen, and the United States brought in as an enforcer for uh, British and French imperialism. That's an, an, another possible interpretation, which one doesn't uh, uh, hear very much of. So his, but history does have a, a great uh, impact. You know, nowadays we're talking about foreign policy. Any time somebody says something like, well, maybe we shouldn't bomb uh, the aspirin factory in uh, Khartoum, or maybe we should, shouldn't bomb civilians in, on a, on, in buses and, uh, and, um, and uh, bridges in uh, Serbia. Uh, maybe we shouldn't keep bombing the water supply of uh, Iraq and so on. Uh, they're accused of being isolationists and not understanding the lessons of the past, which is that once you don't bomb an aspirin factory, then you're going to go on and not bomb a city. Then you're not going to you're go on and not bomb a whole country to smithereens. And it'll end, you know, with another Hitler. Uh, these are the lessons of the past. You know, there's a reason <laughs> why the government spends so much money on their memorials and museums. Um, I imagine uh, that um, people, uh, let's say, uh, sympathizers with the Southern cause must have felt at the time when the Lincoln Memorial was set up pretty much the way I f feel with this uh, FDR Memorial, this massive thing that, that uh, I will ne never see, obviously, never visit, um, that uh, now something had been established somehow in the historical memory of the American people and there was no going back from that. We've now uh, gone to the point where, uh, where Lincoln was memorialized as a great man, a savior, a saint, practically, and we go on from there. Uh, there was no going back to uh, any kind of controversial Lincoln. And presumably that's what they're doing with the FDR <laughs> memorial. Uh, all the, uh, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich said that R Roosevelt was the greatest, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was the greatest president of the 20th century, uh, and all the so-called conservatives and neoconservatives agree with it. <laughs> One of uh, the advantages of being at my advanced age is that, I presume, I will never li live to see the Harry S. Truman uh, memorial, <laughs> and, uh, that the, uh, or hear of the existence of such a thing in Washington. But you see, by creating historical heroes, a certain interpretation is being given to the historical events involved there. And with Roosevelt, obviously, the New Deal is being sanctified uh, by this. So uh, history has always, as Hayek says, uh, has always played a prominent role in uh, creating political views. And uh, there have been different historical uh, uh, schools. Believe, believe it or not, there was once... <laughs> and a very influential historical school in England, uh, the school of the so-called Whig historians, the most famous of whom was Thomas Babington Macaulay. And uh, they were the best-selling -seller, uh, historians. Everybody read them. And their interpretation was in favor of limited constitutional government, uh, in favor of parliament against the Stuart Kings, in favor of free trade against mercantilism. Uh, they were uh, free market and um, uh, very often laissez-faire historians. And it was through their historical works that they conveyed these ideas. In other words, some people read the economists, but many, many more people read the historians who had absorbed these economic views <laughs> and uh, we're passing them on. In a way, I would say it's like with uh, uh, the uh, novels of Ayn Rand. Now, I'll, there are thousands and thousands of copies of Mises' works are sold, but there are hundreds of thousands of copies of Ayn Rand's works sold. And uh, uh, if you take Atlas, for instance, George and I were at the Mises seminar when Ayn uh, came to visit one night, and... Uh, she was very pleased there. Mises was very pleased to, to see her. And uh, uh, it wasn't on the program, but he mentioned something about uh, uh, how important it is to have great uh, writers and great novelists uh, on our side. And he, says, and he said, I say this because we have in our company tonight a great novelist. And I, you know, could be uh, uh, hard and uh, biting sometimes, but she just glowed like a girl. 
uh, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, sweet compliment uh, that Mises made of her. Uh, so with, with her novels, right, um, I mean, uh, uh, Mises writes on the gold standard, a lot of people write on the gold standard, but I think Francisco Danconia's gold standard speech in Atlas Shrugged has been read by, by now millions of people. Not that it's necessarily converted uh, uh, too many, but the ideas have been uh, gotten across. And that's the case of literature. And uh, most often it's the case with, um, with uh, history. Uh, I think these people, for instance, <laughs> who write these uh, television scripts or uh, Hollywood movie scripts uh, that denigrate uh, businessmen, denigrate capitalism and so on, a large part of uh, if you ask them, if you argued with them, a large part of their rationale would come from what they say, well, history has proved this, history has proved that, and so on. Now, in this essay, um, uh, appropriately, since it has to do with uh, this book on capitalism and the historians, Hayek says there are a lot of myths about capitalism. But the supreme myth about capitalism has to do with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's a myth that was taught for generations and generations, uh, uh, until somewhat recently, uh, to um, uh, uh, people, uh, educated the educated public, but also to people who afterwards became influential. You know, ask yourself, how is it that after the Second World War, <coughs> the leaders of, of all these dozens of new independent countries in Asia and Africa and so on, decided to go the route of the planned economy and uh, socialism rather than free enterprise. Many of them, most of the leaders, had studied in Western universities. They'd studied in Paris, London, uh, the uh, Oxbridge, and, and American universities also. And what they'd gotten there was this idea that the Industrial Revolution had been a disaster for working people. Well... Naturally enough, they concluded, if we're going to industrialize and modernize, we don't, we don't want to do it in the way that destroyed, practically destroyed the working class of the Western countries. We'll choose a different way. <coughs> so in many ways, this uh, uh, idea of the Industrial Revolution <coughs> has been, um, has been uh, very influential. And you ask yourself, uh, supposing... One uh, uh, proposes to you the, uh, the concept, industrial revolution. Um, what does your mind uh, conjure up? What pictures come into your head? Well, you know, if, uh, uh, Ayn Rand was remarkable in many ways, and that way, because she says it's these uh, smokestacks that saved mankind. That, uh, and, and she said, you know, if, if people were... Uh, 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 Reverent in the way they should be, they should worship the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution. That is, I think, a minority point of view. <laughs> Supposing I say Industrial Revolution to you, what comes into your mind? Children working in dark factories. Yeah, right? Invention of the steam engine. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> now, invention, invention of a steam engine. We're going to have now a German chronology of all the technology. <laughs> 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 Kevin. Oh, yeah, and, uh, people sit all over their faces. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, okay, sit over the Yeah, okay, very good. Children, children labor, women working, right? This Industrial Revolution was, was so horrible that for the first time in history, women had to work, right? <laughs> Before that, the... Uh, they sort of uh, uh, played around with ceramics and, sto and, and uh, sold them on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> and that's how women mainly lived and, and survived. And the Industrial Revolution somehow forced them into the factories. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. The point is, even with, I would say, a, a fairly enlightened group here, huh, who knows something about it, the pictures are still uh, decisive, aren't they? The pictures that come into your head. Uh, and that's why you cannot judge history from pictures. You can't just see a picture and, and interpret it as, as somehow, or, or suppose that it interprets itself. Um, even uh, Brecht, the, uh, not, uh, the uh, commie uh, poet, said a picture of uh, I.G. Farben is not the history of I.G. Farben. Uh, 
uh, meaning that there's a context to it, there's a, there's, and, and there are interpretations, some better than the other, so you can't go by pictures, you can't go by stories, you can't go by anecdotes, uh, which is what, for a long time, historians who dealt with the Industrial, industrial Revolution did. Um, now, uh, the interesting fact is that the attack on the Industrial Revolution did not start in, in England, because that's where uh, the whole debate uh, first took place, did not start with socialist writers. They're not the first ones who attacked the Industrial Revolution because there were no socialist writers around. It started with the Tory uh, press and the Tory writers and the Tory politicians. And it was a political stratagem. See, what, <laughs> what happened... Uh, let's say, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, after 1815, was that there was a great uh, movement for reform in England, a reform of the House of Commons, a uh, reform of, uh, of uh, uh, an, uh, anti-Catholic legislation, a uh, reform of uh, the uh, abolition of the Corn Laws, uh, which benefited uh, the uh, landed uh, aristocracy at the expense of everybody else. So there was a great uh, end of slavery in, the, uh, in the, uh, the West Indies. So there was a great reform movement. And the Tories um, had to deal with this somehow since it threatened their privileged position. And the way they did it was very clever. They said, uh, you liberals and you people who are financed by the liberal factory owners and you people who want representation now for the uh, uh, liberal uh, factory towns, uh, like uh, Manchester and Birmingham and so on. Don't talk to us about our uh, slaves in the West Indies. Don't talk to us about oppression. You're the worst uh, slave drivers there are. Your factory workers are worse, worse off than our slaves in, uh, in the West Indies. Uh, your, your miners uh, are practically slaves themselves. Uh, you are the ones who are oppressing the people of England <laughs> with your new, newfangled machinery and your newfangled factory system. Um, and the Tories in the House of Commons, who c- controlled the House of Commons at that time, they set up committees to investigate the condition of working people in factories. These are the sort of committees that would be s- and have been set up, let's say, in the U.S. Senate, when Senator Kennedy wants to examine the condition of sweatshops um, in uh, the, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, area of San Francisco or New York. Uh, or bad conditions I don't know, somewhere else or in some industry and so on. What witnesses does he call in? Uh, well, you know what sort, the sort that will come up with horror stories. And this is what happened with the parliamentary investigations. They, uh, they called in anybody who could testify to uh, children working 17 hours a day and getting chopped up by uh, machinery uh, all the time, and women working in uh, mines, dragging coal up and down, and all these terrible conditions that existed. Not that some of these conditions didn't exist. Uh, England was a relatively poor country compared to what happened afterwards and compared to nowadays, of course. <clears throat> but there was a tremendous bias uh, against industrialism and against the factory system in the testimony that was collected by these parliamentary commissions. And this is, uh, this is the way they do things when they have an investigation in the House of uh, Commons. They collect all the uh, evidence and they put out blue books. So these were, all of these blue books existed from different investigations at different times. And they had mainly these terrible horror stories. And that's what they were comprised of. Uh, and it's from this that Tory writers drew their evidence. And it's from this that Friedrich Engels, who wrote a book on the condition of the working class, in England in 1844. It's from this that he drew his evidence also. Now, you can see that this is anecdotal. This is self-selective evidence, and it doesn't really have very much in the way of, uh, of um, uh, scientific uh, weight to it. But uh, economic historians, such as they were, for a number of generations in England, uh, did most of their work from this. It took time for, before historians... Uh, economic historians said, well, look, we have to go beyond this um, uh, con- somewhat contaminated uh, body of evidence. We have to go and find out what um, uh, wages were in the different towns that vary tremendously um, um, uh, uh, around England. We have to uh, go and, and see what the cost of living was, and that means the cost of various commodities. 
Uh, we have to see how much unemployment there was, seasonal unemployment, and that is going to affect the, uh, the uh, aggregate uh, a wage uh, rather than just the wage rate. There's a tremendous amount of data that we have to collect before we can come to any conclusion about this. And that's what they started to do <laughs> around uh, shortly after 1900. And then there's a list or, or a series of historians, economic historians in England, uh, who were considered, uh, called the optimists sometimes, because they had a generally favorable re- a view of in, in the Industrial Revolution. They started with uh, one of the great economic historians of, uh, of uh, British and European history, J.H. Clapham. And then in, uh, around the middle of the uh, 20th century, <laughs> a man who contributed a couple of essays uh, to this collection by Hayek, uh, T.S. Ashton. And Ashton was uh, one of these uh, uh, English Don types. Uh, he says, uh, my students always have a negative view of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I remember reading a, a term paper by one of them where he said, at one time, agriculture was practiced everywhere in England, and today it is limited to the rural areas. Um, Have <laughs> uh, a kind of Weltschmerz uh, world of uh, sorrow about the life uh, at a very uh, uh, young uh, age. Um, and and uh, more uh, recently, uh, Max Hartwell... Uh, uh, R.M. R. Hartwell, right. Everybody, for some reason, calls him Max. Um, who was a professor at Oxford, now retired professor at Oxford in uh, uh, Chicago and then Virginia for a while. And, and there are many, and so these are more or less uh, the theoreticians. Uh, and many, many other uh, uh, economic historians who have gone in and collected the kind of data that's uh, required uh, to come to any reasonable conclusion. So, there's, uh, uh, as I uh, indicate, there are de- there are, uh, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of uh, discussion back and forth. But, uh, as I gather, uh, the um, uh, best conclusion as to living standards of, in- of industrial workers in England uh, from the end of the 18th century to around uh, 1850 is something like this. Um, it was very low towards the end of the 18th century and then rising a little bit, but then going down also from about uh, 1890 to 1815, uh, that then rising very slightly, okay, and then uh, and with dips uh, for industrial, uh, for uh, uh, commercial crises, but then after about um, uh, 18. Uh, 48, 1850, and so on, rising steadily. Okay? So there was a uh, deterioration at a certain point. Uh, it wasn't a spectacular increase in, um, in uh, living standards. On the other hand, what is obvious was that there was no disaster of the kind that the pessimists had talked about. Um, uh, uh, the Hammonds, for instance, another husband and wife uh, team, Barbara Hammond and what was his name, J.L. Hammond, um, wrote uh, uh, extensively on this uh, period. And they said the Industrial Revolution came as a plague upon the working class of England. And uh, maybe that's a view that you still have in the back of your mind. But um, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, who's the uh, leader of the uh, uh, pessimists uh, now, a um, uh, um, Marxist, no, actually a communist historian, Uh, interesting man, but uh, let's say a definite point of view. Or, um, uh, uh, well, he'd be the main one right now. Even they say, well, no, it's not that there was a, a, a catastrophic fall in living standards, but we have to take other things into consideration. There was a lot more pollution than there was before. Uh, living standards did not really explode until after the middle of the century. I mean, go go uh, higher and higher until about the middle of the century. In other words, this view, which maybe you have, that the Industrial Revolution was a catastrophe for working people, is not really shared by anybody in the world or who knows anything about it. 
Well, we'll, talk, we'll have questions in just a little while. Um, so this then is pretty much um, or what the uh, state of research is as far as these things go. But that's not the whole story. Other things have to be taken into consideration. If we have a dip here, it might even be more substantial than that, from about 1790 to about 1815 or a few years later than that, what was happening at that time? Napoleonic Wars. What did you say? Napoleon. The wars against the French Revolution and Napoleon. Right. Uh, England from 17... Uh, 93 until Waterloo in 1815, a whole generation was involved in the um, uh, costliest war in the history of Europe. At the end of that war, England had a greater public debt than all the other countries in the in the world put together because they mainly bankrolled uh, the war. But the point is, you had a whole generation of war right in the middle of this industrializing period, and the capital that could have been used for whatever, factories, uh, uh, improved implements, uh, uh, better uh, fertilization of the soil and so on, and the, uh, all the sort of things that, that uh, would have raised living standards in the uh, private sector was now siphoned off to the public sector and to war. Well, you might say it was necessary to stop Napoleon, whatever, but the point is that was a, uh, a distorting factor <laughs> so you can't simply go by what, ha what happened to working people in this period because their standard of living was depressed by the enormous costs of this war. Uh, and after 1815 and into the uh, uh, 30s and 40s, uh, there was another depressing uh, effect, and that was what I just mentioned before, the corn laws. Now, corn laws, this is in the British usage of corn, meaning uh, cereals, mainly wheat, uh, what we call corn, they call maize. So the corn laws were a high tariff on imported wheat to England. Um, the tariff was put in after 1815 because during the wars, the people who owned the land, England had, had not got, uh, gone through any land reform or anything, so the, uh, the, the great proprietors of the soil in England, the great landowners, uh, during the war, they had gotten a, a windfall a profit from the fact that it was hard to import uh, uh, wheat into, into England. Uh, now, the war is over, wheat starts pouring in, principally from the Baltic uh, area in those days, and the prices plummet. Well, they're the guys who control not only the House of Lords, but the House of Commons also is in their pocket. And what they put in are these laws to keep the price of wheat high by a, a very high uh, uh, tariff on imported wheat. Now, in those days, uh, uh, bread was the chief staple of working people. Perhaps not as much as it had been in previous centuries, but this is why the Bible calls it the staff of life. Uh, working people uh, uh, and, uh, throughout the world, the lower classes throughout the world, um, in uh, in Throughout history, depended on starches mainly in the Western world on bread. Um, and it was a very high proportion of the budget of all working families. And so a very high proportion of the budget of working families was now taxed, super taxed, through, this, through these corn laws. And this existed up until 1846 when uh, the liberals got through their repeal of the corn laws. Uh, that's one of the... Uh, that's part of the heroic uh, period of classical liberalism, uh, where and anybody has to admit that they were on the on the side of uh, of justice, and they were on, on the side of the of the good of the people, uh, against the small group of, of uh, exploiters and, uh, and and parasites, uh, who were the uh, uh, the ruling classes at the time. Uh, in case you don't know uh, names, I mentioned in my first lecture that uh, we're going to be coming across names that you've never heard before, but it's uh, not your fault. Uh, your professors didn't think it was necessary to bring them to your attention. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, guys in the whole history of liberalism, Richard Cobden. Um, and his uh, buddy, John Bright, and they formed what is called the Manchester School because they were centered in Manchester. And they got together and uh, uh, formed this uh, anti-corn law league. And it was the first 
um, organization of its type uh, probably in the world. Because what they did is they got money in from manufacturers from the north uh, who uh, uh, thought that it would in- increase their trade, international trade. If they could import um, uh, wheat, for instance, and massively from other countries, the other countries then would have resources to import British manufactured goods, so it would help them. So they got money from uh, manufacturers in the north, and they set up a very large or unprecedented propaganda apparatus. Uh, they put out millions of pamphlets. They put out newspapers. They put out books. They hired halls in, uh, in uh, London for weeks at a time. Uh, they had campaigns and, and elected people to the House of Commons, like Cobden and Bright. And then finally, in uh, 1846, they uh, converted the leaders of the, uh, of the uh, Whig and Tory parties, both of them, uh, to the uh, logic of free trade, and England went over to free trade and became the beacon of free trade in uh, the Western world. Uh, so, but by that time, from 1815 to 1846, the Corn Laws had done their damage and depressed the standard of living of working people throughout uh, uh, England. Another thing that you have to consider when you talk about bad, working condi- uh, bad living conditions for working people in the first part of the 19th century, is what were they like before? Right? It's not... In logic, you can't say, well, they were very bad. They could have been worse before. Uh, now if you want to go by Blake and the New Jerusalem and so on, which is a gorgeous hymn that everybody loves, uh, that uh, somehow one, at one time England was so beautiful that, uh, that they could... But you could picture Jesus walking there. Uh, but then came the dark satanic mills. Uh, and however, Blake might have mentioned that, uh, meant that people understood, uh, whether he was talking about the church or whatever, um, people understood that to mean the mills, the factories. And that made this terrible uh, England that we see in the middle of the 19th century. But... Um, what, what, in fact, what were the conditions before uh, the Industrial Revolution came? What was, it, what was the conditions for working people as a whole? Well, we know more about this from here. Here's an example of a quotation from a recent uh, British historian, Neil McKendrick. Uh, wrote a book called The Birth of the Consumer Society. Now he says, the prelapsarian myth, here's a new word for you, write it in your vocabulary, and just thank God that you were admitted to the Mises Summer University. <laughs> Prelapsarian. You know, just throw it into conversation. It fits <laughs> many different contexts. What does prelapsarian mean? Well, this lap, what laps? The fall of man from the Garden of Eden. That's what's being referred to. So if you talk about prelapsarian, it means the condition of human beings in paradise. Before terrible things happened, uh, people had to work and so on. So he's saying prelapsarian myth. So he's saying that there's a myth about the pre-industrial revolution as if before then it had been a garden of Eden. The prelapsarian myth has been shaken too, he says, by our increasing appreciation of the texture of poverty in the pre-industrial world. And he uh, uh, calls on uh, the French... um, Historians of the Annals School, a famous school in the 20th and mid 20th century, because what they did, they investigated the the details of everyday life. Uh, they thought this was important, uh, not just the uh, the doings of the high politicians, which are important also, but what was life like as experienced by the average person. When we read that the poor in towns and countryside lived in almost complete deprivation or that the average man's income was so low that even a poor man's diet absorbed 60 to 80% of that income, 
and then bread being the largest part of that. Uh, after having bought their food, the mass of people had little left for their wants, no matter how elementary they were. In pre-industrial Europe, the purchase of a garment or the cloth for a garment remained a luxury the common people could afford only a few times in their lives. In other words, uh, the slogan of the time was not shop till you drop, <laughs> right? It was a very different world. Uh, when we hear that even the clothes of plague victims were eagerly sought by their relatives, when we learn of the low expectation of life, the high infant mortality, the sickness which threaded their lives, the poor diet, and few comforts they had to sustain themselves, then the gains of the Industrial Revolution become more impressive. So, another thing to keep in mind is we have to compare uh, the first half of the 19th century in England with what had gone before. Um, Engels, of course, uh, begins uh, uh, his book by, say, by talking about how uh, uh, great it was uh, in, the, in the meadows, the uh, happy uh, uh, British uh, farmers and uh, uh, roast beef and uh, Yorkshire pudding and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, this uh, chart over here, which um, I will interpret uh, uh, to you. These are countries, those are numbers. <laughs> These are dates. Am I right so far, Professor? Yes, thank you. Um, now, you know, uh, I think it was in my first lecture that I mentioned that uh, Mises is not a professional historian. That's not his great claim to fame, but he understood history and he could put his finger on the crucial thing. This is the crucial thing about the Industrial Revolution that Europe underwent an unprecedented population explosion. Okay? Um, the only figure that I was able to five, uh, find for the mid-18th uh, uh, century was 6 million. 6 million inhabitants of England. And the population of England had never been larger than that. Okay? By 1800, you see, already doubled. That is unprecedented. That is unprecedented. Doubled again by the middle of the century. And similarly for most countries, now France, what you see here is the famous French birth deficit of the 19th century, uh, which worried the French very much, and uh, especially in contrast to the German uh, vast increase in population. Um, 1800 and 1850, there's no one Germany, those are the German states. The states that afterwards will become the United Germany. Notice here Ireland. Okay. Uh, 6.5 is around um, 1845 or so. Okay, what we have here is Ireland tremendously overpopulated for its resources. And if you want to find out something about the Irish famine, the, the terrible Irish famine, uh, there's a very good book by Tom Bethel called the Tom Bethel called the Noblest Triumph. Now, I wouldn't agree with everything he says, but he has a very interesting chapter on Ireland. Uh, the noblest triumph, according to Bethel, is the triumph of private property, of the principle of private property. And his chapter on Ireland is very interesting, uh, because what he says there is this. Uh, yeah, there was a potato bug, a, a potato virus, a potato disease, but it didn't just strike Ireland. It struck Scotland, Holland, North Germany. Why did it have such a terrible impact on Ireland? And the uh, reason, he says, was because of the political and social conditions of the past century or so. There was a constant seething uh, civil war going on, virtually a civil war. Uh, there was an immense hatred of the absentee landowners, an immense hatred of the, uh, of the uh, English in general and the, of the Protestants. There was no, and there, were, and there was arson, there were, there were, uh, there were uh, riots. There was a, uh, effectively very little security for property rights in Ireland. So that nobody bothered to, none of the people who had capital bothered to invest in Ireland. They took everything they could in the way of high rents and so on and gave nothing back in the way of, a, of an infrastructure or capital accumulation in Ireland. So that the people of Ireland, unlike the Scots and the Germans and the Dutch, <coughs> were just living on the very verge of subsistence. And the reason for that was because of the lack of capital accumulation, in turn because of the insecurity for property rights in Ireland. 
then the disease comes and they fall below the level of subsistence. So that it's a complicated picture. People want to say that the Irish starved because uh, the English were too stingy <coughs> to give them welfare and, uh, and so on. Well, first of all, there's, there was no organization in the world that was prepared to deal with not just one year of, uh, of the collapse of the potato, uh, but of, of four consecutive years. This was an unprecedented disaster, and no, no private or public uh, organization was in a position to deal with that. But the underlying causes Bethel talks about, and I find that very interesting. So you see here, okay, and now in the, the, some of these cases, like Italy and Germany, these are uh, uh, net uh, gains when we allow for the millions and millions who went overseas. So this is the huge population explosion that occurred in Europe. And the, with, given, and by the way, all across Eurasia, in China also, India, and so, uh, and, and so on. But as um, uh, Rosenberg and Birdsell, uh, a book I haven't mentioned so far, which is a very important book, I should have mentioned in my first lecture, by um, uh, uh, Nathaniel uh, Rosenberg, uh, for those of you who are not from New York, I'll spell Rosenberg. Okay, and, and uh, Birdsell uh, called How the West Grew Rich. And it covers a lot of, of history. It covers some of the things I was talking about in my first lecture about the uh, basic institutions of medieval Europe. Uh, and now, in this book, uh, they talk a little bit about the Industrial Revolution, and it was, and they make the point Mises had made before them. Uh, they made the point that Ayn Rand had made before them that the Industrial Revolution was a salvation of the European working class. If it had not been for the immense productivity increases that came from industrialization, they would not have been able to support the new millions and tens of millions of people. First of all, to have them survive, and then, with increasing prosperity. Prosperity little by little. So that by 1900, European socialism is in a tremendous crisis. Because in Germany, Edward Bernstein says, Marx's predictions have not come true. The working class is not getting poorer and poorer. It's getting little by little, wealthier and wealthier. So how are we going to have a socialist revolution? Uh, so this is what happened in the, uh, in the course of the... Of the uh, uh, of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And uh, Ashton, whom I mentioned before, this historian in, uh, in his essay um, in, um, uh, in Capitalism and Historians, says, if you want to see a place that undergoes a population explosion, but no Industrial Revolution, uh, you can go to Calcutta, uh, or you can go to Ireland, there were no terrible factories in Ireland. The British had seen to that through their uh, mercantilist laws for so many years. Uh, Ireland was, uh, was pristine. You know, there's countryside there. I guess it rains all the time. Which, uh, uh, But anyway, it, uh, so nice green emerald isle uh, without the, the dirty, filthy, polluting factories. And uh, when the famine came, they died. And there's a point that is made by... Um, by uh, non-free market uh, uh, historians whom I could mention, this counterfactual point. What would have happened in England and in Europe and in the Western world uh, given the population explosion if, they had not, if there had not been an industrial revolution? Now, again in my first talk, which really was rather good, I think, I have to admit, and... Um, um, <laughs> I mentioned that, an, that uh, an immense amount of work has been done on the history of socialism, an immense amount of work. One thing I have not seen, which I don't think should be too difficult, is this. There were socialist writers, of course, at the time of the Industrial Revolution, and some of them had um, uh, programs and plans for how to deal with the new world, this new uh, economic world that was coming into existence. Now, Marx and Engels, who were shrewd as anything, and strategists above all, did not have a plan, right? They didn't say that this is what we should do now to deal with the terrible situation, because they said, well, we'll wait until capitalism develops fully, then there'll be the socialist revolution, and then everybody will get everything they need. But they didn't have specific 
uh, plans. But some of them did. Uh, a man named Charles Fourier, for instance, a Frenchman, one of the so-called utopian socialists, uh, said that all of society should be organized into uh, small communities <coughs> called phalanges, uh, and um, these communities should be of whatever, so maybe 2,000 people broken up into small work groups, and uh, maybe 10, 12 people, 20 people in a work group doing a specific task. However, in the course of a day, since the division of labor is such a disgusting and stultifying thing, they should go from one task to another, maybe change tasks four or five times a day. Uh, because this would satisfy, uh, he talked about different human instincts, and the human being has also a butterfly instinct, uh, papillon instinct, okay? That means to go from one, uh, sort of from one flower to another, go from one task to another. And this would be emotionally satisfying. Okay, well, why don't these people examine the likely consequences of having dealt, of dealing with this industrial revolution, this unprecedented population explosion, by using the papillon effect, okay? Uh, others, like uh, Ferdinand LaSalle in Germany, or Louis Blanc, said that uh, we, deal, we should set up productive uh, cooperatives, producer cooperatives, funded by the government. And that's how we, we, we'll deal, instead of this terrible factory system and the capitalists and so on, you have worker, government-funded uh, producer cooperatives. Well, you don't have to be an expert in public choice to imagine that uh, there might be a certain amount of inefficiency that would uh, slip into that situation. The Western world was very lucky to have a class of capitalists who were ruthlessly um, addicted uh, to economic efficiency because it was a very poor world, and any wealth that was lost uh, through inefficiency was at the expense of the mass of people. Uh, the capitalists uh, were, uh, were by and, especially in England, by and large efficient. They accumulated capital, and that's what helped the next uh, wave of workers, the next generation of workers. Um, and this is something, you know, look, um, uh, uh, Hayek uh, never had much resentment against people. He was, but uh, uh, Mises, I'm, uh, I, well, he was such a good-natured and, and, uh, and well-balanced guy, but still he had to have felt um, a certain amount of resentment that uh, for, for, for decades he was virtually the only person around who said some of these obvious things. Um, so this is something that uh, uh, is ignored when people talk about um, the Industrial Revolution. What would the socialist alternatives have been? Now, finally, I just want to make a couple of uh, um, statements about, uh, in general, why some of these ideas spread the way they do. Um, in one of our uh, seminars uh, early on, uh, the question was raised, uh, why is it what to us seem like obvious truths are eclipsed by very false ideas. And that brings us necessarily to the uh, big question of the sociology of the intellectual. Because people's ideas about society, I mentioned they come from historians. Well, now, let's say nowadays they come from, uh, <coughs> from movies or whatever, television uh, or something, newspapers, books, novelists. Uh, but those people get their ideas and their general orientation generally from their professors. Most of them go to college, go through this uh, period of uh, indoctrination in college. So then the question is, why do intellectuals, and especially why do academics, uh, come up with these ideas? Uh, you know, basically, I think, false ideas, a false um, uh, interpretation, a false outlook on, on the world as, as a whole, the social world as a whole. Uh, and I don't have it, uh, I'm not going to be able to give you a final answer on this. There are different... Uh, uh, reasons. Uh, now, Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, famous in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, famously says this, that what happens is that capitalism uh, creates an overproduction of college-educated people. Uh, well, certainly creates an overproduction of, uh, or something creates an overproduction of lawyers, I'll tell you that. Uh, and I trust that no one here is, is, plans to be a lawyer. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, he said, so he says, 
an overproduction of college-educated people. They can't all get the, the sort of jobs they think are appropriate to, to their uh, training and skill. Uh, so they're underemployed and maybe even unemployed. And that this creates the bias against capitalism, which is then translated into, uh, uh, into all of these myths about capitalism. Well, uh, that doesn't uh, ring true to me because some of the most influential anti-capitalist intellectuals have been very successful. Right? I mean, they, uh, they win Nobel Prizes in, uh, in literature, or the, uh, they teach at uh, elite universities and, and so on. So what is the reason? It's, it's very uh, uh, hard to say. But that it exists and that there's a general bias against our point of view, and in a way, uh, I don't think it would be too much to say a mindless bias, I think we can prove maybe in our own experience. Now, Bob Nozick, uh, who was a libertarian at one time, and I don't know what his position is now, I guess not as much of a libertarian as he was once, Robert Nozick of Harvard. Um, uh, still, I think he's basically a free market man. And in an essay of his, he talks about an experience which I think maybe some of us have had. Okay, you're talking to somebody... And they come to the, they find out you're a libertarian, uh, basically in favor of uh, uh, laissez-faire. And they say, well, uh, what about uh, the Industrial Revolution? And then you say certain things about that. Maybe you some, come up with some of the arguments that I've given you. Uh, and they say, uh, well, uh, then what about uh, discrimination against minorities? Uh, or then uh, what about the sexism? Uh, or what about pollution and destruction of the environment? Um, Bob said, Bob's point is, that it doesn't matter that you've answered one set of arguments, you've answered one accusation, they'll immediately go on to the next one, and the next one after that, right? It's as if nothing is going to satisfy them. It's as if they're looking for some accusation, some indictment of capitalism, that's going to be it. And that's what Schumpeter said, that the intellectuals, they carry the... Uh, um, they, uh, st uh, capitalism stands its trial before the intellectuals who already have the sentence of death in their pocket. And it doesn't matter what the indictment is. The indictment changes all the time. Um, when uh, George and I were uh, uh, maybe around your age, uh, the uh, indictment included the fact that very soon, first of all, automation, I don't know if you even know the term, but there was something called automation that was going to lead to mass unemployment. Okay? Uh, at that time, the, working, the workforce was maybe 40 million or something. Uh, not only that, but very soon, this was right after Sputnik, very soon the, the Soviet Union would show that socialism is more efficient than capitalism. Uh, and then there were Galbraith's uh, arguments about uh, the consumer society, how um, uh, everybody's engaged in a... a, a, a uh, struggled to, for piggish uh, affluence. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, the uh, minority groups are not allowed this piggish affluence. Uh, so there's a kind of contradiction there. Uh, uh, affluence is piggish for some and not others. Uh, but and it, but it, it constantly changes. Through the decades, it changed. Back in the 19th century, it was that capitalism cannot secure to its slaves uh, even existence in their own slavery because it leads to a, a deteriorating standard of living and the dying off of the working class. Um, and then uh, that uh, uh, imperialist wars were inevitable among capitalist uh, countries. Um, that was uh, uh, Lenin's contribution. Um, that, um, um, well, the, the, the depressions were inevitable. That the middle class was disappearing. This middle class has been disappearing for 200 years, <laughs> according to the leftists, right? I mean, it's just going to be a mass of, of, uh, of faceless, uh, impoverished workers and a few elite capitalists at the top. And all of the middle classes are going to disappear. Now, this, the revision of socialist Bernstein already said that in 1900, that's another prediction that's not coming true. Yeah, there are more and more rich people, but there are more and more smaller firms and uh, middle-sized businesses to supply the large Companies And anyway, joint stock companies are not owned just by a few people. They could be owned by thousands and thousands of people. So the middle class is not disappearing. But, but so nothing satisfies them. Um, now globalization, right? Um, they're on the right track in the sense that there's a lot of uh, 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 corrupt politics going on with so-called globalization. Um, and... Uh, 
Um, I mean, uh, should they have these riots at Genoa and other places? Ah, oh, there's so many things to worry about in the world. Uh, when, the, when the rulers of the world get together and decide among themselves what to do about us, I'm not that worried that, they, that they, their time is spoiled a little bit. They might be late for dinner uh, and so on because of riots in the street. Uh, so that's not as far as I'm concerned a problem, except that the ideas of these uh, rioters are, are um, uh, not very viable. If it was up to them, um, no, no globalization, no, uh, no movement of, uh, of capital from richer countries to poorer countries to set up factories uh, in poorer countries. Who, who do they think they're helping with that? Uh, the, the Nike is not allowed to, to employ children in, uh, in uh, Indonesia. What happens to children in Indonesia if they're not employed in factories? Huh? They, they starve or the girls go into prostitution. They, they become young prostitutes for the, uh, uh, for the Japanese and, the, and whoever else uh, is going to take advantage for, uh, of them. Um, fa- the factory system uh, was the salvation of uh, the average woman, not the elite woman, but the average woman, as, as they knew at the time, in the United, the United States, for instance. The textile mills in New England, then when they moved down to the Carolinas and Georgia and so on, the, the cigarette factories, because the, the woman now did not have to be under the thumb of that louse. Right? <laughs> the, the girls know what I mean. The girls know what I'm talking about. Right? They could go out and they could earn their own living. They get their own paycheck. It was not a lot, and they had to work. But really, women actually have worked, did work before the Industrial Revolution. Take it from me. I mean, take my word for it. So that uh, these feminists who think that capitalism is responsible for, for uh, uh, the terrible condition of women, also that Western civilization somehow is responsible for the oppression of women. And uh, so dishonest are they that uh, they uh, make explicit decisions not to talk about what other civilizations and cultures do to women, because that would break up their coalition. That would be- break up their rainbow coalition. What, uh, what Africans and, and Arabs and uh, Chinese and Indians and so on do about women. That's not, that can't be talked about. Only in the West, somehow, women are, are oppressed by our terrible uh, European civilization. <coughs> well, enough demagoguery on my part. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes left if anybody wants to say anything or make any comment, your own views about things. I raise the question of, you know, why do most people have the views they have because of the intellectuals? I, but I said, uh, you know, I don't really know the answer. Yes? Um, I think one reason people have these views is they saw America put a man on the moon, and they think if the government can do that, government can do everything. I right. think that's one of the biggest um, illusions people have. That's a very interesting point, very good point. And there is, there always is, that's a very interesting point. There's also psychological overestimation of the government's military. Somehow the military uh, is supposed to be a really efficient, fine, powerful machine, right? And the government always parades it uh, on its holidays, doesn't it? I mean, that's, that's the symbol of government might. The planes flying overhead, the marching soldiers and so on. Um, the the uh, uh, military personnel who surround the president and so on. Um, there's no cost-benefit analysis on something like that. The military is, I think that you have to ask anybody who served time in the military, it's the most wasteful, inefficient operation you can imagine. This idea of uh, superb efficiency is, is just a mirage, but it does, it does um, answer to, to, uh, to something that people want to believe. You talked about the dire predictions of the socialists not coming true. But usually I think what they'll say is, yeah, because there was government intervention and we prevented all this. Well, okay, and that's one reason why you can't uh, decide history on a simply uh, post hoc uh, ergo propter hoc basis, you know, that something happened and therefore, and what happened afterwards was caused by what happened before. You have to have an... That's how shallow they usually are. Well, you have to have analysis on that. Uh, for instance, they say that, well, trade unions came along. Well, you have to analyze what, tra- what labor unions do. 
And you don't have to be an Austrian to understand what labor unions do. The Chicago people have talked about it. Friedman talks about it. What, what the labor unions do is restrict the amount uh, by raising the price above a market, the market level. What happens to any commodity, and in that respect, labor is a commodity, uh, is that the amount sold is decreased. So you raise uh, wage rates above uh, the market level, fewer people get employed. And uh, some Chicago economists made the, uh, uh, the calculation because of trade unions in America, uh, trade union, uh, labor unions, uh, that we call them here, labor union members have gotten 6% more than, than they would have otherwise, and all other workers have gotten about 3 or 4% less because they can't go into the, uh, into the uh, 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 areas that are now unionized because the labor is now restricted because the price is too high, they now go into other areas and compete with other workers uh, for, for, uh, for lower wages. So some workers are benefited, but the majority of workers are not benefited by labor unions. But peop- so you have to, in other words, you have to have analysis. You can't say <laughs> we had welfare legislation, we had unions, um, we had the regulation of, uh, of uh, factories and so on, and that's why things are better. You have to actually analyze the, re- the uh, results in a theoretical kind of way, the results of the, those government actions. Yes? Um, earlier you were raising the point of um, why do we have these misconceived thoughts or information. But I think it was um, on Monday or something, we said, why doesn't the truth win out? Yeah. Said, because of media. I think that's the same reason here. Like we'd rather see. You said German marching Germans are always on the, the History Channel. Yeah. Because it plays on our. I, I kind of yeah, I sort of like that. As a matter of fact, uh, we'd rather see that. In a funny kind of way. Like, I think the American public would rather see that because it's so emotional. And we're like, yeah, this yeah. is why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but you know you have, then you have to say why does the media the media people why do they have the ideas they have and to my, it's because they've uh, uh, taken part in this general academic uh, environment. Uh, uh, Max, Hart, uh, Max Hartwell, one of the economic historians I mentioned before, gave a very good talk at a Montpellier meeting uh, where he said uh, uh, to the average college student, uh, um, it, it's experienced in this way that one department one discipline, field after the other, converges on one single um, conclusion. Whether you're studying history or economics or philosophy or sociology, whatever it might be, the conclusion is that private enterprise, property, the capitalist system is fatally or largely defective and that it's the government that helps us. Uh, whether, you, whether you read, uh, you know, Steinbeck or uh, uh, Upton Sinclair or whatever in a literature course um, or um, a history courses, of course, economics courses, of course. Sociology was a science founded in order to combat uh, free enterprise economics. Uh, that the whole of college education is almost directed uh, to uh, producing an anti-capitalist mentality. Yes? It stems from the... the, the Intellectuals want to spin things in a new way so that they can get name recognition. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it is for self aggrandizement reasons. Well, that's certainly not the true of uh, college professors. We are a, an extremely idealistic and self denying group. <laughs> um, and we deserve tenure for that reason. Uh, nobody else deserves a lifetime guarantee of a job. But I think Professor Reisman uh, will agree with me, and as well as <laughs> Professor Vetter and the other professors here, that, um, that tenure is something that uh, college professors deserve, because you really can't allow uh, judgment on them based on what you people, the consumers, think of them. Um, <laughs> while I'm at it, I, while I'm at it I, I also should point out to you that your most sacred obligation at least for the next few years, is to pay your Social Security taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>